Let's talk a bit about, I want to talk about the directors as well, but before we do that, let's talk about large, grandiose, theatrical, naturalistic, naturalism. English theatre tends to be more psychologically driven and rooted in our version of reality and French theatre or Derek Goldby theatre tends to be more large. Although his delicatessen was not at all. It was very psychologically rooted. What is that about? To you who have done so much Greek and Racine, you walk both sides of the inner psychological kind of theatre and then the Racine uh, kind of theatre. How does that work with your reflexes? Terrible question. I it's should a question of degrees, I think. It's, first of all, the, the words you're given to express it, whatever feelings you are, and then you have to, you know, you can do the Scottish play, and people go, how do you do that? And you go, well, we've all made lines in the sand for ourselves, morally, ethically. And then maybe you cross that little one, but not the next one. And then you cross another one, until eventually you're in a moral desert, and there are no lines to be crossed and you don't know where you are. So if you think Lady M thinks that her husband should be king, you should do this. And in fact, you should do this. And you lose all sight of what is moral, is right. But in the way that you, if you're playing Lady M, the it's kind of key signature of how you perform it. Um, you know, I've seen the very down, feet in the earth kind of psychological delivery, and I've seen the more, dare we say, histrionic delivery. How do you choose which key signature? I don't think about the how. I think about how much do I want what I want. Um, I think you're put into the physical world where you are. By the director. By the director, the designer. But Shakespeare's words are Shakespeare's words. And uh, I mean, I don't think anybody would want to say, I'm doing the histrionic version, <laughs> right? I mean, no. who sets out to do the histrionic <coughs> version? Who sets out to do it, I'm doing down and dirty, although that gets more points, but we're all trying to do it like from great need and uh, convince him to do it. Go do it. I mean, basically what you're saying is, this is the time now. If you were ever a man, this is the time. Pulling out every tactic in the book until you have to go to the last one, which is, you know, I have given suck, you know, and, you know, I have known what it is to love a child. And if, if I had sworn to do what you have, I would do this. But I say would take we have that a, baby. But say we have a, a, a Lithuanian or a, a, a Polish director who says, yeah. Shana, okay, when you're doing that moment, I've now set a thing upstage. You will have your back to the audience for the entire Fine. speech. I still you get the words. I still get the words. I did Antony and Cleopatra with uh, Sasha Marin, Alexander Marin, who's Russian. It was his first Shakespeare he had directed in English. He was looking at the Russian and directing. I mean, Morris Podbury was also directing, but he eventually handed it over to Sasha. It was wonderful. We still had the words. Right. We were doing all kinds of wonderful things with it. I mean, it was, it was exciting. You are speaking this language, which is uh, contrived in the sense that it's poetry. You're speaking in iambic pentameter. You're speaking in verse. You're speaking with assonance and alliteration and repetition of vowels and sounds and plosives that do something to you viscerally. The sound does something to you, you know? In concupiscible lust, you know? That's from measure for measure. You could have said, you know, I don't know, he was horny. I don't know. Do you know what I mean? But you don't. This is what you're given to say. So it's balancing your awareness of lyricism and all those things that are, are part of Shakespeare's rhetorical world, you know, where you have to convince and you have to dispute and you have to organize thought and you have to present your argument. But it's with the need of a human being. It's with the passions of a human being. It's, uh, I'm not interested in hearing well-spoken verse if I don't care about the human being that's speaking it. So you can't leave your acting chops in one bag and your <laughs> literary awareness in another. But I think you have to have both because that gives you an inventory to choose from. How do you prepare for your first day of rehearsal? <sighs> read the play, read the play, read the play. That's it. Really? Just three times? 
three. No, use these more. Um, you know, you, with Shakespeare, you can do a lot of work at home if you if you have you know interesting text things. I mean, I I do certain things with the text. I first of all, I put all the full stops in. You know, I mark them. I I know which lines are are ten normal beats and which are eleven, twelve, fourteen. So something's going on there. I know that. Um, and then you start to play. Then in rehearsal is when you it's with the people. It's with the human beings. And. Uh, and I've worked with a lot of different people on Shakespeare, you know, and, and it's and it's balancing that, making making them human beings that we're compelled by. And when you were playing a Juliet or a Portia or a Hermione or a, um, do you have some senses of how you would like to explore this person before you start I to have rehearse? I have certain ideas about who they are, but I think you first of all have to acknowledge your preconceptions. I see Masha and Three Sisters this way, or I see Portia this way. And then you have to acknowledge that so you can get rid of it, because otherwise it will always be there. Right. And you will have a vision of, you know, first day of readings, you know, they always kind of, because everybody in that room has some idea of where they might want to go, but everybody's kind of holding back. And I think, why waste the time? If I have some idea of where I'd like to go, I'm, this is my first chance to read this. That thing about no acting, please. I think that means, I don't know what that means. I don't know what that means. No acting, please. I'm an actor. Even if I'm reading, I'm an actor. I'm going to bring something to it, I hope. Just saying the words, that's a waste of time to me. You know? Well, you've said it yourself. When you say a word, you're in fact, your body is listening, and right. you are in fact reacting to right. what you have just heard in your body. I mean, yes. And I mean, you know, my biggest you know, thing right now, if I have three hours to teach a class or something, that's all I have, the one thing I'll do, let's ask questions. Because what I hear is so many questions are not questions. This is my pet peeve at the moment, is that, uh, will you go hunt, my lord? Will you go hunt, my lord? That's, uh, do you feel compelled to answer that? No. So flat, it falls flat. But if you go, will you go hunt, my lord? Or will you go hunt, my lord? Will you do something? Will you get off your ass and do something instead of listening to this music? And we're all dying here, you know, listening to the same song over and over and over again. You know that there has to be a question that someone feels they need to answer. If you don't need an answer, don't ask it. And people say, what if it's rhetorical? I said, you have to provoke thought, even if you know the answer. You want them to think about it so you can answer it before they do. Shall I do this? No, I won't. But you have to go, shall I do this? No, I don't think so. For that moment, the audience has to be thinking about, oh, I could answer that. You know, dost thou love me? Dost thou love me? I know that will say I. But if you go, dost thou love me? I, to get to, I know that will say I. But you have to go, <coughs> dost thou love me? I know you'll say yes, but I need the answer from you. When you asked the question just now, you become vulnerable. In that yes. vulnerability, I stepped in and went, oh my gosh. But that's it too. And I think that's something, especially with young people, y you, it's a risk to be that vul vulnerable, to say, I don't know. You know, I don't know the answer, or I need an answer. I need something from you. You know, kids, you know, they might say, you want to go to the mall? <laughs> Therefore, if you reject me, it's not really a rejection because I haven't really asked. I haven't really asked, but, but we, it doesn't arrest our ear, and we don't, you don't crack yourself open. I'm interested in the cracks, I'm not interested in the polish and the veneer. I want to see the cracks. I want to get in there.